Well, at universities, there's a special subspecies of speech that's connected to the form of knowledge I was just describing. I call this subspecies disciplined speech. Disciplined speech is speech that is disciplined first by its commitments to evidence. Remember the first of the values of the HXA way, make your case with evidence. Introduce uh, John Tomasi. So John Tomasi is, is the inaugural president of, of Heterodox Academy, which is a global community of, of academics and students based in the United States, uh, which promotes open inquiry, viewpoint diversity, and constructive disagreement in institutions of higher learning. Uh, John himself is a political philosopher. So prior to joining the Heterodox Academy, he was the Romeo Alton 1843 professor of natural theology at Brown University. Um, I should say, John is joining us in the United States due to the time difference. This is very, very early in the morning in the United States. So we're, uh, we're particularly grateful uh, to, to him for, for speaking at this time. Um, and his speech is entitled uh, Disciplined Speech, an American Perspective. And with that, I will hand over to John. Hi there, uh, I'm John Tomasi. Um, I'm just really delighted to be here. But I wanna thank the Office for Students for inviting me to, to speak with you today. It's an extremely important moment in education across the world and especially so in the UK. Uh, we've all been following uh, the events that you're, that you're um, passing through with great interest and I'm really honored to be here. It is, as just mentioned a little bit earlier for me here than it is for you there and it's also regrettably the fact that I'm not a morning person. And yet here we are. So um, <laughs> I'm really happy to be here. Now let me see if I can, uh, despite not being a morning person, share my screen just for a few minutes. Let me get up what I want, sorry. Uh, I'm the president of Heterodox Academy. Uh, it's an organization of professors and administrators who love our universities, who believe they can be reformed from the inside. There are a lot of critics of universities, obviously, but we're people who share some share many of the concerns that the critics have, and, and at our approaches to try to work from the inside to uh, with it, working with administrators and with our fellow colleagues on the faculty and, and with our students in our classrooms to create better experiences for students. And our mission, is to improve the quality of teaching and research, basically by trying to change the culture uh, within universities, by encouraging these three values, open inquiry, which, mean, which means something like um, letting curiosity be free, and viewpoint diversity, which in these polarized times is often read to mean left versus right politically, and that is an important dimension of diversity that we care about. But we mean diversity much more widely than that. We mean viewpoint diversity, including the viewpoints of diversity that comes from different experiences, different communities that one's a member of, um, different religious viewpoints, different deep views of the world. And then we're also, my favorite is the third, our third value, which is constructive disagreement, which to me means something like learning how to listen to each other, finding ways past our biases, past the anger and, and distrust that so often people feel in our society these days, to try to find a way to remind ourselves that we're, that we're scholars together, we're learners together, and that's a great adventure that we can be on together if we can find the strength of character within ourselves to open those doors. And HXA, Hedrox Academy, um, we're the world's largest member or membership organization of professors and administrators committed to these values. Um, we have 5,500 plus members now. Um, our top we're all across the academy. Our top, our top disciplines are psychology, philosophy, political science, economics, and history. We're increasingly moving into STEM and have a large presence now in, in medical schools. We're in 49 states in the US. Um, the only state we're not in is Hawaii, which I'm saving for a recruitment trip perhaps in February to get at least one member to join us. And we are in 57 countries. And I'll just say one last thing I'll say about us is that those three values are what we are as part of our mission, open inquiry, viewpoint diversity, constructive disagreement. But more generally, we try to, 
we try to um, encourage the ways of being on campus. We encourage these ways of being um, in the way we teach, in the way we interact with our, our colleagues uh, in, in department meetings and in our research. Um, and we have, some, we have something that we take into call the, the HXA way, which you can see there on the screen, I hope. Uh, make your case with evidence. So, you know, show the facts, re revert to facts when, they, when we have some. Be intellectually charitable, which means don't just straw man your opponents, try to steel man your opponent. Um, be intellectually humble and you know, be aware that uh, there are giants and we are standing on their shoulders in various ways, whoever we are. And that's something to, to keep in mind whenever we have a strongly held opinion that maybe we're wrong about that opinion. There's always more to learn. Be constructive, which means to, which means to um, you know, look for the good in what people are saying rather than sort of leaping to what's bad and what they're saying. Um, be constructive, oh, sorry, and then be yourself which just means that you know, each of us is a person at the end of the day. We sometimes inhabit roles and are seen to play these roles on campus. But in fact, at the end of the day, we're all just individual people doing our best in this world. And it's good to remember that. So I'll stop sharing now. And uh, I'm going to, I wanna, I wanna invite you to, I know the incredibly important issues that you're talking about here today and you've gathered to discuss. What I want to do is to try to step back or invite you to step back with me to take sort of a, a broader view and to consider a question I think is prior to a lot of the specific questions that are roiling the UK about statutory torts and other um, really interesting um, developments. And I want you to invite, I want to invite you to consider with me this question of what's the ideal of speech, the ideal of speech that's appropriate within a university. And I'm going to suggest that that ideal is something that I call disciplined speech. And I'm going to contrast disciplined speech with free speech. And I'm going to suggest that of those two, it's disciplined speech that we should care most about within the context of the university. Um, to talk about speech and the kind of speech we should care about within universities and we should seek to protect within universities. I think we have to think about a concept that's right behind that, which is the idea of knowledge. So um, as mentioned, I'm, I'm a philosopher. And uh, although it's, as I, and although, uh, I, sorry, I'm a philosopher. <laughs> and um, I wanna do a little bit of philosophizing with you. It won't be painful, I, tr I promise. Um, and I, I wanna talk with you about knowledge. And when I talk about knowledge, about the kind of knowledge we value at the university, that'll help us see, I think, the kind of speech we value at the university. So let me do give a word about knowledge. And I'm gonna begin with a philosopher's example, um, but it's a homey one and I hope you won't mind. So I own a blue Subaru Outback. Um, it's a clunker of a car, but I love it. I think when I first bought the Outback, I thought it was made in Australia, but even when I found out that it wasn't, I still loved my car. Um, this morning, um, I got up, made my cup of, cup of coffee, a big cup of coffee, and I drove <laughs> and I drove my Outback uh, onto campus, and I parked it um, outside outside my door at the entranceway of, of of the of the building. Now, if someone asked me, "Is there a blue Subaru Outback parked outside your building right now?" I would say, "Yes, there's a blue Subaru out Su blue Subaru Outback." parked outside people. I just drove it there. I parked it. I walked in. But now imagine with me that when I drove up this morning, a thief was watching me and he saw me go outside my car like a professor with my papers fumbling around, kind of stumbling around, in fact. And I dropped my keys on the ground, but didn't notice that. And I eventually walked into the building with my papers thinking about, about this talk. The thief seeing his opportunity picked up my key, climbed into my car and sped off. And as he was peeling out of the entrance to the parking lot, imagine uh, one of my colleagues who also happens to be an owner of a blue Subaru Outback was slowly driving into the parking lot, looking around for an open space, seeing the one that had just been vacated by my car and drove her car to a stop in my, in my parking spot. Now, remember, as before, I sitting here now, if those events had all occurred out there, I sitting here now believe 
that there's a blue Subaru Outback parked outside uh, in the parking lot. And in fact, it is true that there's a blue Subaru Outback parked outside in the parking lot. In fact, exactly where I think it's parked. So I believe something. And the thing that I believe is true. It's a certain accomplishment of knowledge. And yet, I think you'll agree with me that something's gone wrong with my understanding about the state of affairs in the parking lot. Um, philosophers would say that I lack justification for my belief, for my true belief, and therefore lacking justification, not being connected to the information in the right way, not being connected to that truth in the right way, means that I, my knowledge is defective or I have no knowledge at all. What philosophers mean when they say that is that I don't really understand the situation about my car in the parking lot, that I lack depth of appreciation for the state of affairs regarding my car in the parking lot, that in some sense, some important sense, I missed the story. I missed the drama of what happened this morning what, and what led there to be that particular now blue Subaru Outback um, in the parking lot out there. My knowledge, the kind of knowledge I have is two-dimensional. It's truncated. Even though, it's, even though I have the belief that it's true, something fundamental is missing. Now, that may sound like an irrelevant or a, a, a full, a, an abstract philosopher's point, and I suppose it is one. But let's take the same thing. Let's do the same thing again. But this time we'll do it in the context of higher education. So imagine a first year student, uh, we, what we used to call a fresher at Oxford. Imagine the student arriving on campus, fervently believing some piece of ideological, some, some, some ideological view. So imagine she arrives on campus fervently believing, let's say, the most extreme predictions about climate change. There are various models, there's a consensus on some general issues, of course, but now this person believes the most extreme of the available models about climate change. Believing that, believing that in fact, um, this situation is as dire as the most extreme predictions uh, make possible, she also fervently believes in extreme remedies. So she believes what the US we call the green, AOC calls the Green New Deal, and maybe a souped up version of the Green New Deal. Why does she believe this? Why does she believe these, this, 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 this theory? She believes it because when she was 16, she watched a TikTok video and saw pop, her favorite pop star, or perhaps AOC herself, um, predicting the end of the world as we know it and advocating a souped up version of the Green New Deal. So as a 16 year old, she saw this TikTok video, was just taken with it, and therefore became convinced that these things were true. As a result of this firmly held belief of hers, she never took a course on climate change while she was at the university. Um, she never took a course on climate science of any kind. She never learned what a climate model is or that there was more than one climate model and how that makes it interesting for us to try to figure out which model is the best one to go with. She also never studied public policy or economics. Thus, she has no idea about the concept of opportunity cost. She doesn't know that debates about energy policy are deeply connected with the debates about economic development. In the dorms, when she spent time in her evenings in the dorm with her friends, she never seriously discussed climate change with her fellow students, except say with friends who shared her exact view and other people in the dorm who would express views that were deviant from her view on encountering them, she would just roll her eyes and walk away and not listen. She never attended public lectures on climate science unless the speaker agreed with her or perhaps if she did, she went there to shout down or heckle a speaker who deviated from her doctrinaire view. But now imagine that 10 years after she graduated, a robust scientific consensus emerged on a specific model of climate change. 
And that consensus turned out to be that the most extreme earlier prediction was correct. So what that student heard on TikTok turned out, alas, to be true. That is, it is as bad as the most extreme work models predict. And it is therefore also true that as a matter of public policy, very extreme measures are necessary immediately. Imagine I'm saying that 10 years from now, that proved to be true. What would we say now about this student? What would we say about the education, her educational experience that she received in higher education? What would we say about the qual her quality of understanding that had been afforded to her by her experience in four years on the university? Granted, as the case with the Subaru, granted, the things she believed, the fact that she believed, because she watched a TikTok video, the fact that she believed turned out to be true. But I don't think that we think much of her educational experience, neither the way she approached it or what the university delivered to her. She'd be a lot like me and my blue Subaru Outback. When it comes to climate change, we might say about her, she never understood, she never came to understand the situation. Her appreciation of the problem and the range of solutions never deepened. Her view was two-dimensional, just like my two-dimensional view, but there is a blue Subaru out there not knowing all the drama that had happened. She completely missed the story, we might say. She missed the drama, missed out on the drama. She was not a participant in any way in the great journey of discovery that people at universities especially have been engaged on that led them finally to the regrettable consensus on climate change. We would say that her knowledge, her form of understanding was deeply defective, even though true. Now I mention all that, I, I say all that. So I wanna emphasize that the kind of information, the kind of understanding that we seek at universities, that we seek to impart to our students that we seek to develop and practice ourselves as, 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 as researchers is really more about the reasons and the understanding and the context and a deepening of our, our appreciation of our world than it is about particular facts. That means to me that thinking about those reasonings, those forms of justification, those forms of understanding is what we're truly about at the university. Now, if that's true, that means that we've what's valued on campus is more is something even more than than truth. It asks us for sophistication, for multi-sidedness, for nuance, for something like expertise. And that conception of what kind of knowledge we value at universities bears directly on the kind of speech that we value at universities. The forms of speech and expression that should be valued most on university campuses. In the US, we talk a lot about the First Amendment, which protects wide freedoms of, um, of expression, wider even than, than, in, than in the UK, though we got the ideas from you guys, of course. Um, the First Amendment protects silly forms of expression, and it should. It protects the forms of expression of pop stars on TikTok. I don't actually walk watch TikTok, but I gather there are pop stars on TikTok, perhaps. Fuzzy animals too, presumably. Um, the First Amendment also protects consequential forms of expression. For example, the heated speech, for, heated forms of speech that we find in political campaigns, um, distortions and exaggerations and all. Um, but what of universities? Well, at universities, there's a special subspecies of speech that's connected to the form of knowledge I was just describing. I call this subspecies discipline speech. Discipline speech is speech that is disciplined first by its commitments to evidence. Remember the first of the values of the HXA way, make your case with evidence. That is, don't just give your opinions and your views and what you feel. You can do that too. But as you start to get serious and you want to communicate with others, refer to common things, or at least potentially common things. Refer to things outside of yourself 
things that have been developed by experts with knowledge in these fields in that deeper, richer sense, and use those as touchstones, common touchstones, to continue your disagreement in a more enlightened way. So disciplined speech is disciplined first by it, its commitment to evidence and to reasoned analysis, to not just go to emotion, not just to go to your personal experience, though that can be relevant, of course, but also to always seek those common touchstones that could provide the possibility of communicating together about speech. Discipline, discipline speech is also disciplined because it's informed by the mainstream findings of relevant disciplines. Discipline speech is literally disciplined in this sense. It means that if you're going to talk about climate change or about any important public policy measure in our, in our, that our world is facing, you should understand some of the basic ideas of, of, of how we do, how economists and public policy practitioners use the tools of their fields. You should know what opportunity cost is. You should know what a cost benefit analysis is. And as you, if you're interested in science and the sciences themselves, you should understand what a climate model is. You should learn the mainstream findings of these disciplines. You should be able to use those in your conversations. And those are the marks of an educated person. There's much more that I could say about how that conception of speech, discipline speech, bears on the questions, the regulatory questions that you're dealing with the, dealing within the UK on a national level, and we're dealing here in the US with on a, on a state level, though who knows who may soon be dealing on a national level too, following you guys yet again. But I'll but I've reached my 15 minute limit, so I'll stop there. I'd just like to say again that um, it's a kind of speech, a disciplined speech that I hope you'll think about. I think you'll think about, hope you'll think back about the deeper issues. What are you trying to achieve? What kind of community, what kind of experiences for students are you are we really after? And I hope you'll think about evaluating statutes and possibilities and regulations and implementation of those regulations in ways that keep that all in mind. Again, thank you so much for having me here. It's really been a pleasure and an honor. Thank, take care. Thank you.